welcome um, Petra and Sarah. It's really great that you've been able to come along to the session today on The Great Gatsby. Uh, this talk is going to take the form of a series of thought experiments, you know, rather than being a, a neat and tidy lecture about The Great Gatsby. And there are two reasons for this. The first one is that one of the key skills that literature students develop is associative thinking, which is the skill of making imaginative and critical connections across a range of topics, ideas and discourses. And the advantage of associate thinking is that it opens up new ways of thinking about things, it encourages us to ask a different set of questions about topics that we think we know about, and it makes space for original and independent lines of thinking and analysis. So all of these are really important skills that you learn as a student of literature. And then secondly, as far as The Great Gatsby is concerned, I'm interested in thinking about its relevance for today. So this involves asking questions about how and why a novel published in the 20s connects with life in 2021. So broadly speaking, I'm interested in asking what The Great Gatsby has to say about issues of social justice today, and in order to explore that, I'm going to narrow down and think about what connects The Great Gatsby with Donald Trump, COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter. So I want to open up this thought experiment by asking you a question. Um, what do you think connects Trump, Donald, um, Black Lives Matter, The Great Gatsby and COVID-19? You can put some um, responses in the chat or speak uh, online, whatever you prefer, and just one word answers will do for now. They don't need to be fully formed responses. Just open up the chat so I can see. So what can it, what do you think connects The Great Gatsby, Donald Trump and Black Lives Matter? Any ideas? Money, corruption, classism, racism. Yeah, that's a really good set of responses. Any other ideas? As Lauren says, there are no right and wrong responses. This is just a way to generate some thoughts about what connects Trump, Black Lives Matter, COVID-19 and The Great Gatsby. <clears throat> well, the one thing that I want to narrow down on is the American dream. So there are many things that connect these four um, aspects of contemporary reality, but I think the American dream is a key one. So having studied The Great Gatsby, you're very familiar with the concept of the American dream. And according to the Collins Dictionary, the American dream is the US ideal according to which equality of opportunity permits any American to aspire to high attainment and material success. So in many ways, the, the novel The Great Gatsby embodies the American dream. And this is obviously symbolised in the character of Jay Gatsby, who was born into a working class family, but who rose through the social ranks to achieve wealth and status. But one reason why The Great Gatsby remains so relevant for us today is the way in which it dares to interrogate the fragility of the American dream. It, analyzes the American dream as a piece of political and ideological propaganda. So if we look back at this definition here in the Collins Dictionary, one of the key words is equality. And I want to test the idea of equality by looking at how the Great Gatsby explores ideas of equality in relation to class and in relation to race. So at this point, I want to introduce a term that might be new to you. <clears throat> the term is historical acoustomology. Now, what does that mean? Well, historical acoustomology means listening to history and culture. It means paying attention to sounds of the past, to the noises of the past events, and it means developing a practice of knowing through listening. So when we practice historical acoustomology as students of literature, what we do is we pay attention to the acoustic landscapes of a novel. So literature is often thought to be a silent medium, but that isn't the case at all. Novels, poems and plays have acoustic landscapes. They're full of voices, they're full of sounds, full of noises and full of silences, which is also a sound. 
So when I listened to The Great Gatsby, I realised that it's one of the noisiest novels I've ever listened to. So let's listen to an example here. This is Nick narrating. There was music from my neighbour's house through the summer nights. In his blue gardens, men and girls came and went like moths among the whisperings and the champagne and the stars. On weekends, his Rolls Royce became an omnibus, bearing parties to and from the city between nine in the morning and long past midnight. While his station wagon scampered like a brisk yellow bug to meet all trains. And on Mondays, eight servants, including an extra gardener, toiled all day with mops and scrubbing brushes and hammers and garden shears, repairing the ravages of the night before. OK, so I'm going to ask um, what might seem like an odd question, but imagine you are present in these scenes. What can you hear? What can you hear in these scenes as they're being described? Again, just put some one word responses in the chat if you have some ideas. <clears throat> music. That's right. Excellent. The, the novel is full of music, class, race. Excellent. People talking. Yeah. What kind of people? Crickets. Excellent. You're really imagining yourself here in these kind of warm, balmy evenings. These are really great responses. Music, cars, omnibus, laughter, different speech. Great. That, that's really good. So let me just go back to the presentation. So you're starting to get the, the gist of what I'm getting at here. Um, in relation to this broad concern of equality, I think there are two main sounds that we can hear and consider. Firstly, we can hear the sounds of wealth. We can hear the sounds of the American dream. The acoustic landscape of Gatsby's parties is rich with sounds, as you've said, of money, privilege, extravagance and hedonism. In the section, we can hear jazz music, gossip, laughter, the swishing of expensive dresses as people come and go. We can hear the tapping of exp expensive dancing shoes, the clinking of champagne glasses, the roaring of motor engines, the sounds of tires on gravel. So if we immerse ourselves in these imagined sounds in the passage, we can hear class elitism. But on the other hand, if we listen closely, <clears throat> we can also hear the industry of party making. So I'll just draw your attention to the final sentence in this passage. And on Mondays, eight servants, including an extra gardener, toiled all day with mops and scrubbing brushes and hammers and garden shears, repairing the ravages of the night before. So what we can hear here is the labour of party making. We can hear the sounds of various forms of physical labour that go into making Gatsby's parties so lavish. We can hear the swishing of mops, the scrubbing of the scrubbing sounds of brushes as servants clean floors. We can hear hammers and garden shears as the gardeners try to repair the damage caused by the night before. So what emerges out of these contrasting sounds, if we pay attention to the soundscape of the novel, we can hear class division. The sounds made by Gatsby's party goers are very different to the sounds made by Gatsby's servants. But of course, without the servants, without the maids, the cooks, the pot washers, the gardeners and the bellboys, these parties wouldn't happen. So these working class characters are, are, are not visible, but they are essential presences at Gatsby's lavish parties. And of course, as we know, some of the working class characters in the novel, such as Merton and George Wilson, they don't get to go to Gatsby's parties at all. For them, the jazz age is a tantalising part of the present that has nothing to do with them. So for poor old George, the jazz age is a sound that's always in the far distance. The American dream is something that he can hear other people living. So this is quite a useful transition to consider the lost generation of the novel and its significance for The Great Gatsby. So the lost generation is probably a term you're aware of. It was popularised by another author called Ernest Hemingway, a great American author, and it referred to the generation of people that came of age during the First World War. 
So this includes the soldiers that fought in Europe, like Gatsby and Nick, who were lucky enough to return home. But it also includes the men and the women who contributed to the war effort on the home front. So just as in England, the war mobilised the entire American population and its economy to produce not just, fo not just soldiers to fight, but food supplies, ammunition, equipment, uniform and the money needed to win the war. But even though the end of war brought peace, it brought with it many economic problems, including a severe recession and mass unemployment. So on this slide here, we can see a line of people queuing up for food. They're all living on the, on the poverty line. They're struggling to make ends meet in 1920s America. But what's really interesting about this image is that you can't help but notice the irony of it. In the background, we have an image of a white middle class family living the American dream. There's no way like the American way, the world's highest standard of living. So the American dream is writ large across this advertising poster. But for the poor members of society, the American dream and its promise of a better life for anyone who was prepared to work for it was a corrupt and a bitter fiction. So the term the lost generation doesn't just mean the vanished or disappeared. It refers to people who were disillusioned and alienated and directionless. So there was a huge amount of disillusion amongst the post-war generation because society was so desperately trying to recover from the ravages of war. Now, in The Great Gatsby, we encounter different class members of the lost generation, such as the Wilsons. Um, they are clearly not living the American dream. They live in a part of the city called the Valley of Ashes. So I'm just going to read this quotation on the slide, which describes where the Wilsons live. About halfway between West Egg and New York, the motor, the motor road hastily joins the railroad and runs beside it for a quarter of a mile so as to shrink away from a certain desolate area of land. This is a valley of ashes, a fantastic farm where ashes grow like wheat into ridges and hills and grotesque gardens, where ashes take the forms of houses and chimneys and rising smoke, and finally, with a transcendent air, sorry, with a transcendent effort of men who move dimly and already crumbling through the powdery air. So one thing that we can't really fail to notice as we look at this quotation is the repetition of the word ashes. What do you think is its significance? Why is it repeated? And what does it tell us about the lives of the lost generation? Just pop some, again, one word answers in the chat. Indistinct grey entropy, yeah, excellent entropy, sort of death, uselessness, fire, falling apart, extinguished. Yeah, so these are all negative, um, negative descriptions. This isn't uh, a part of a city that's burgeoning with growth and progress, something of no value. That's right. And that was a really important part of the disillusionment of the lost generation, that they felt that they had no value and sadness. That's that's a really good response. This is a really emotive section of the passage. It's a world away from the parties and the frivolity of Gatsby's parties. So these descriptions of the residents of the Valley of the Ashes, they couldn't be further removed from the descriptions of what we heard earlier with the upper class party goers. George Wilson's world is very black and white, and it exists in sharp contrast with the brightly coloured world of Jay Gatsby. Now, other members of the lost generation that I'm interested in considering are the African-American population, because this links two key issues in the novel, the issue of social inequality and the issue of racial inequality. Now, it's fair to say that The Great Gatsby is a predominantly white novel, by which I mean it's full of white characters. There are a few significant moments, however, in which African-American characters are mentioned or given visibility. And this is one example. So this slide is taken from Baz Luhrmann's filming of The Great Gatsby. And again, this is Nick observing. Nick is constantly observing what's happening around him. And he says, as we crossed Blackwell's Island, a limousine passed us 
driven by a white chauffeur, in which sat three modish negroes, two bucks and a girl. I laughed aloud as the yolks of their eyes eyeballs rolled. Sorry, I'll say it again. I laughed aloud as the yolks of their eyeballs rolled towards us in haughty rivalry. So on the surface we could read this as evidence of how the American dream is open to everyone. We can see here evidence of how racial and class barriers can be overcome in order to access higher structures of society and wealth. But I want us to practice this skill of historical acoustomology again and listen to what Nick is saying. I'm interested in why he focuses on the eyes of these young and wealthy black people. Why does he talk about the yolks of their eyeballs? It strikes me as such an odd thing to comment on. What do you think? Just pop some answers in the chat. <clears throat> difference good ah very good okay so difference that that's a really good point because of the haughty look that they displayed yet yeah, so perhaps there's an interpretation there of a certain kind of arrogance that these people have arrived uh, nick sees them as alienated from himself eyes are a mirror, he can't see himself in him. These are great responses. You know, you're absolutely right. He's looking at them as others. You know, he, they are not quite part of his world, even though they are part of that American dream world. They're, they're great responses. Um, I want to develop some of your thoughts. No, so let me just... What? Uh, something's appeared on my screen that I just need to get rid of. There we go. Um, so again, let's listen closely to this quotation. Because as we listen to it, we can realise that it's much more complex than we might first think. So he talks about the yolks of their eyeballs. Now, what we see here in this image is a depiction of slavery. When slaves were transported from plantations to work, they were yoked together. In this image, we see four men with large forked wooden sticks around their necks. These implements of control and discipline were called yokes, spelt Y-O-K-E. So as we can see in this image, the forked end of the yoke was placed around a slave's neck and an iron bar was put in place to, to hold, it, uh, hold it firm. And the yokes were made of hard wood, which meant that they were quite heavy. They, they weighed about seven kilograms and they were about two meters in length. And this was to keep the slaves apart. And in order to prevent the men from trying to run away, their family members were also often roped or chained to them. And in this image here, we can see a female slave, she could be a wife or a sister, with a chain around her neck. So, by listening very carefully to Nick's narration, so not just what he says, but the sounds of his narrative, we can open up a deeper embedded meaning. What Fitzgerald is doing here with the word yoke, Y-O-L-K-S, and the word yoke, Y-O-K-E-S, is he's using homophones. So homophone is when two words sound the same, but they're spelt differently. So the, the, the yoke of the eyeball and there's the yoke of the instrument. They sound the same, but they convey very different meanings. So what Nick is revealing here through the sound of the word yoke is a long history of exploitation, of cruelty and violence against African-Americans. So whilst the young, fashionable black characters appear to have transcended their traumatic history of slavery, the novel is reminding us through the sound of Nick's narration, that this isn't the case for the vast majority of African-Americans. That's because after the First World War, African-American soldiers, they returned home, but they weren't treated as heroes. They were treated as racial inferiors. They were deprived of civil rights. They were discriminated against and they were subjected to sustained violence by white supremacists, particularly in the South of America. 
And also after the war, a large proportion of African-Americans, they worked in the south of America as sharecroppers on the land. But in the 1920s, the, the climate was, was really poor, the weather was really bad, and the price of crops fell due to poor harvest, which meant that the 1920s was a decade of hard and unforgiving labour for many African-Americans. There was no chance that they could take part in an American dream. So despite the image of young black wealth, it's extremely important to keep in mind how deeply divided America was on the grounds of race. So in relation to that, it's worth pointing out that The Great Gatsby was published at a moment um, of important uh, political moment when there were lots of debates then, as there are now, about immigration and national identity. So immigration laws such as the 1921 Emergency Quota Act and the 1924 Quota Act were put in place. And what these acts did was they limited the number of immigrants coming in to the United States. And these quotas went a very long way to enshrining white supremacist attitudes in national immigration law. So this quotation on your slide is the South Carolina Senator Ellison Durant Smith speaking in support of the 1924 Quota Act. He said, it seems to me the point as to this measure is that the time has arrived when we should shut the door. Thank God we have in America perhaps the largest percentage of any country in the world of the pure, unadulterated Anglo-Saxon stock. It is for the preservation of that splendid stock that has characterised us that I would make this not an asylum for the oppressed of all countries. Now, these white supremacist views, they find their echo in, a great, in The Great Gatsby in the voice of Tom Buchanan. So Tom Buchanan's narrative is tainted with xenophobia, so that the hatred, the fear of foreigners, and it's tainted with nationalism. In the opening chapter, so right at the very beginning of The Great Gatsby, Tom discusses white supremacist views, and he does so in relation to a fictional book called The Rise of the Coloured Empire, which is based on a real life book, which I've um, reproduced on this slide, called The Rising Tide of Colour, The Threat Against White World Supremacy. Now, this book was published in 1920 by a man called Lothrop Stoddard. It sold extremely well and it was taken up by politicians to shape legislation. It was taken up by politicians to shape immigrant policy. And what it did was it reinforced the need for racial segregation. So if we read out Tom's um, statement, you can hear in it echoes of Ellison Durant. Early on in the novel, Tom is talking to his friends and he says, if we don't look out for the white, white race, sorry, if we don't look out, the white race will be, will be utterly submerged. These books are all scientific. This fellow has worked out the whole thing. It's up to us who are the dominant race to watch out or these other races will have control of things. So here we can hear like we can hear the discourse of othering that we picked up on previously when we were talking about mixed narration of the yokes of the people's eyes. So my question um, for us all is what relevance does this have for modern day America? Well, under the presidency of Donald J. Trump, American politics was dominated by propaganda slogans calling to make America great again. And the power of this slogan partly lay in its nationalistic impulse. It also partly lay in its appeal to the American dream. So when Trump first launched his presidential campaign back in 2015, he was recorded as saying the following. Sadly, the American dream is dead. An audience member says, well, bring it back. And Trump's response was, if I get elected president, I will bring it back bigger and better and stronger than ever before, and we will make America great again. Now, for, for all of the criticism that's been directed at Trump for his positions on immigration and his position on the global climate crisis, it does have to be acknowledged that his economic policies did lead to a rise in employment and economic growth for American industry. And in response to this, Eric Trump 
one of Donald's sons, claimed that his father had been responsible for the resurrection of the American dream. He said, we have achieved something that was incredible and something that is so much bigger than what we are. <clears throat> and it shows that the American dream is alive. And under him, I think the American dream is going to be stronger than it ever was before. Well, is that the case? Is the American dream open to everybody in contemporary America? Many, econ e many economists in America have demonstrated a strong counter argument. They've demonstrated that the wealth generated during Trump's present presidency wasn't well distributed at all. Instead, inequality is higher today in America than it has been since the 1920s, since the decade of the Great Gatsby. So in the Forbes magazine, Jesse Colombo um, very interestingly wrote that it's not fashionable to wear flapper dresses and to do the Charleston, but 1920s style wealth inequality is definitely back in style. America's ultra rich haven't held as much of the country's wealth since the jazz age. So that's a really helpful quotation for us to see the parallels between the world of the Great Gatsby and the world of contemporary America in relation to inequality. There were also there was an important report written on the Forum of Economics after liberal, liberalism by a bunch of researchers uh, who said, we live in an age of astonishing inequality. Income and wealth disparities in the US have risen to heights not seen since the Gilded Age, so the age of the Great Gatsby and they are among the highest in the developed world. Importantly, racial disparities in wealth and well-being remain stubbornly persistent. So we start to see here that the, the aspects of social and class and racial inequality that Fitzgerald is discussing in The Great Gatsby have as much relevance, if not more, now. Now, one of my questions to you is in relation to the image at the top of this slide. So we're very familiar with uh, the propagandistic slogan, um, make America great again. But the rhetoric also shifted during Trump's uh, presidential campaign and it became um, a call to action to keep America great. Keep America great. So what I'm interested in hearing from you is, what do you think the verb keep means? in this context. To keep America great again. <clears throat> it's different to make. <laughs> and it's significant. It's a great country, so let's keep it that way. Keep me in power. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, I th think sort of Trump uh, does see himself as synonymous with the greatness of, of the nation. Can we link it back to some of the ideas that we've explored so far in relation to sort of racial equality and immigration, do you think? If you want to keep something a particular way. So let's have a let's fix state, absolutely fix state, not moving. Let's keep things static, you know, because change um, can be risky and change can allow for difference. And they don't want difference there. I believe in that country. I love it. Trust me, I can keep it that way. Yeah, I mean, this is great. You're, you're all along um, the right lines. What I wanted to kind of draw down to is, is that there's a distinct echo here of Lothrop Stoddard, the author of the Rising Tide book, and Tom Buchanan. The verb to keep is deeply caught up with anti-immigrant discourse. It's caught up with white supremacy and racial exclusion. So keeping America great is essentially about letting the right kind of people, namely white Americans, live the American dream. So this idea is embodied in the half-built wall that Trump erected along the Mexican border. Here we can see uh, a family of, of people 
looking through the wall into a land that they are not allowed access to. By keeping them out, Trump can keep America great. So that, that, that verbal shift from make America great to keep America great, it looks, it's quite subtle, but it's really significant. And by drilling down into its significance, just thinking associatively, you know, thinking out loud, you know, without any pressure to come up with um, sort of neat and coherent answers, you can start to connect ideas. And if Fitzgerald were alive today, I think he would see that the inequality that he's depicted in The Great Gatsby has actually widened. In the 20s, there was a huge gap. Now there is a gaping abyss and the president has built or half built a huge wall in order to keep America great again. But of course, the recent sweep of COVID-19 across the globe it's not only made a mockery of the idea of walls being able to maintain some sort of national integrity or protection. It's also killed nearly four million people globally and 600,000 people in America alone. COVID has damaged national and international economies and it's created agonising uncertainty about the future. Now, interestingly, Fitzgerald's characters also lived through a pandemic. And that pandemic was the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 to 1920, which killed an estimated 50 million people worldwide and nearly 700,000 in the US. So the image you can see on the left of the slide is a makeshift emergency hospital that was built to treat members of the public. We can think of it as a 1920s equivalent to the emergency hospitals that were erected across Britain, such as the Nightingale hospitals, which were set up in you know, quite random places like the XL Arena in London's Dockland. You know, that kind of random location sort of, sort of shows the, the urgency of the issue. Now, what's really curious to me about The Great Gatsby is that it never directly mentions the flu epidemic. Why that is so remains to be debated, but it's true to say, I think, that the, the structural inequalities, the inequality of, of class um, and, and race that the Great Gatsby draws attention to, they are inevitably shaped and energised by the Spanish flu pandemic and its consequences. So whilst they're not addressed directly in the novel, they are present indirectly throughout the novel. Now, this following quotation taken from uh, a report from the World Economic Forum, speculates on the future of America after COVID. And it has equal resonance, I think, for the lost generation of Fitzgerald's novel. The pandemic will leave the poor further disadvantaged. The inequality gap between rich and poor has widened after previous epidemics and COVID-19 will be no different. If past pandemics are any guide, the toll on poorer and vulnerable segments of society will be several times worse. Indeed, a recent poll of top, economic, top economists found that the vast majority felt the COVID-19 pandemic will worsen inequality, in part through its disproportionate impact on low skilled workers. So what's implied in this passage about financial class and social inequality is the brutal reality of racial inequality in 21st century America. An established narrative of the impact of COVID-19 in the USA has been the decimation of black and minority communities, many of whom embody the low skilled workers that this report comments on here. So, so many people simply cannot afford to miss a shift due to illness, let alone can they afford health care and insurance. And there's one last thing that I want us to consider in relation to COVID and Trump and the American dream, and that's the Black Lives Matter movement. So in the midst of the pandemic, America was torn apart by the death of George Floyd, Af an African-American killed by the white police officer, Derek Chauvin, who was assisted by three fellow police officers. And this happened in Minneapolis, in Minnesota, in, 1920, in 2020. In response to this killing, demonstrations and protests have taken place all over the world and throughout the United States, with demonstrators calling for an end to police brutality, with, to an end to systemic racism, an end to poverty, an end to income inequality, an end to inequalities in education, healthcare, and basic matters 
of social justice. So one of the, the Black Lives Matter um, organisers said the following. When Derek Chauvin pressed his knee on George Floyd's neck, he committed a brutal, horrific murder. He had three immediate collaborators. And this is the important bit, but they are not alone in their guilt. Their behaviour is enabled by the systemic rot of racism. 400 years of white supremacy have put the American dream of democracy on life support. When black lives don't matter, none of our lives matter. When black rights don't matter, the American constitution does not matter. Now, in this quotation, I'm sure you'll agree that the diagnosis of the American dream as a dream of democracy on life support is absolutely damning. But it is the reality of so many Americans today. And it was the reality of so many Americans in Fitzgerald's world of the 1920s. With such great insight into the inequalities of post-war, post-pandemic America, Fitzgerald was able to examine and expose the fragility of the American dream. And he does this directly and he does it in indirect ways as well. So quite what he would make of the degree to which the American dream has come apart over the course of the 20th and 21st centuries is something that we can only really speculate on. But the warning signs are all there in the novel. And that's one of the reasons why The Great Gatsby remains such a valuable and provocative um, and important novel, I think, for 2021. So as a way of conclusion, then, uh, what we've been doing is we've been making connections between The Great Gatsby, Donald Trump, COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter. It might have seemed like quite a stretch at the beginning of this sort of short session, but through associative thinking, we've been able to um, uncover and uh, interrogate some key issues. As we've discussed together, one of the key things that connects them is the idea of the American dream, an idea built on the notion of equality. But as we've discovered, The Great Gatsby is an important novel because it reveals the many forms of inequality at the heart of 1920s America, social inequality, class inequality, and significantly, I think, racial inequality. So in order to explore these established ideas in new ways, we've practiced this new skill of historical acoustemology, a practice of knowing through listening. So you know, in future, always listen closely to the texts that you're reading. By listening closely to passages of The Great Gatsby, we've en enhanced our understanding of how deeply divided 1920s America was on social and racial grounds. And by listening to the novel, we've gained new insights into the very long history of racial inequality in American history. And we can also hear how inequality manifests itself today. So in turn, this has opened up new ways of connecting the novel with contemporary issues of social justice that are um, constellated around Donald Trump, COVID-19 and the Black Lives Matter movement. So The Great Gatsby's exploration of racial justice has huge significance for us. Its engagement with issues of white supremacy, which is a returning um, and really urgent and problematic issue for us at the moment, um, helps us to think through some of the complexities around um, migration and the complexities of anti-immigration discourse. So racial inequality is at the heart of America's COVID-19 crisis. It's at the heart of the Black Lives Matter movement. And Black Lives Matter, as we now know, it's, an, it's become a global movement to eradicate su white supremacy, racial violence and discrimination. So if we read The Great Gatsby closely and importantly, if we listen to it really carefully, its warnings against the consequences of inequality sound just as loudly now as they did then. So what I'd like to do now is I'm going to stop showing my screen and open up for some questions. Any questions or comments? Very, thank very you. welcome. Thank you very thank much, very much Jeanette. Jeanette. You're welcome. Um, thank, you all, thank you all for listening. <laughs> <clears throat> that, was that was really, really, really interesting. interesting and we are happy to take questions. I know that um, our attendees today have um, 
been really interactive in the chat throughout that which was really useful and great. makes these sessions better yeah. but if you do have any questions please do feel free to put them in the chat now um, before we head over to our next session today. I'm also just going to pop my email into the chat so you could all, all you're very welcome to contact me and follow up um, if you have any questions. Um, oh, where did I come across the word acoustomology? Well, um, OK, so I'm, as Lauren said, I work at the intersection of literature and history and politics. So I'm interested in how those three discourses enter into conversation with each other. And I write, I write a lot about history and the way that history is discussed within text. And I just started to ask the question of what does history sound like? You know, um, it might seem like a bit of a weird question, really, but I, I was very interested in trying to immerse myself in the sounds of the past. So I did some research and I discovered that there's this, this branch of academic research called historical acoustomology, which um, encourages people to kind of think about the sounds of past events in order to better understand how those events came into being. So you could do a Google search into it. There's some fantastic books out there about um, listening to history. And that's how I came across the word. Um, how can inequality be changed? Why hasn't, why hasn't there been, well, I mean, my goodness, yeah, I wish I had the answers to that question. I, I, I think one, one of the, but one of the simple but gross responses to that is that um, many people are poor and disadvantaged because a small proportion of people are immensely wealthy, you know, and and there are, there's a lot of greed um, within the kind of human condition. And I think that people can make an awful lot of money out of the, the poverty of, of other people. Um, I, I think that that's one kind of really kind of gross, grossly sort of simplistic response, human greed. Um, I, I think racism is, is at the heart of a structural inequality. We've, we saw it in the UK as well with COVID. So um, they're two starting points, I think. Is there a weed in the system which kills every tribe? Well, um, I think as Trump's um, slogan, keep America great, suggests some people want to keep things as they are because they're benefiting from the system as it exists you know so if, if you're incredibly wealthy if you're one of the the one percent of people you know that 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 owns 99 percent of the world's wealth why would you want to change things you know why would you want to share because you're doing really well out of it so we need to kind of think really um well not just think we need to act um, upon these kind of issues of inequality and better understand and develop sort of empathy, I think, for other people's situations and live in a world <clears throat> in which we encourage more connection between people as opposed to living in our silos, as we often do. In, I mean, living <clears throat> online is, is, is great, but it doesn't always um, allow for connectivity and interaction. And there are really difficult conversations to be had. Claire, it'd be interesting to see the trajectory of the Harlem Renaissance. Absolutely, how it paralleled the timeline in the novel Gatsby. Yeah, America is not America to me, nor homeland in the homeland. Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent set, set of suggestions. Of course, parallel to <clears throat> the development of the great Gatsby, there was this incredible sort of form of American modernism called the Harlem Renaissance, uh, which went a long way to realising the civil rights movements in the 1960s. So. You know, I think even though Gatsby's novel, sorry, Fitzgerald's novel is a very white uh, upper middle class novel, it is deeply concerned with issues of race and exclusion and otherness and inequality. <clears throat> you, you've been absolutely fantastic, everyone. Thank you so much for participating in the way that you have. It makes such a difference, as Lauren says, to, you know, to have interactive exchange and and please do contact me if you'd like to sort of follow up um yeah i mean the spanish flu it, it's a really conspicuous absence from the novel i mean why he didn't include it in a direct way who knows but I, but as i say if you go back to the novel and you think about some of the structures of inequality and how they come into being in their narrative there can be ways of of linking it back um, 
are there any characters that are unwell? You know, it, what are the metaphors of illness in the novel? It could be one way of opening up this kind of hidden historical narrative of the Spanish flu, which I think is a nice kind of conceptual bridge to COVID-19 now. And Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Jeanette, for answering the questions as well. And, and just, just again to the attendees, it's really, really positive when we have interactions throughout the sessions because it just gives more substance to what to what the session is really and that's really nice to see um so i am going to post a couple of links if that is okay yeah. the first link i'm going to pop into the chat is the um eventbrite link which is and uh, the link to all of the other sessions that we are running this week and i am aware that some of you have already been to other sessions so it's really nice to see you returning um, and joining us through you know the duration of this week and the second link I'm going to post as well is the link to the feedback form um, and we'd really appreciate just a couple of moments of your time just to go through that and just to provide us with some information and a bit of your feedback on how you found the session. Um, so we can see that Claire said amazing experience to listen to this presentation, eye opening, thank you again. Um, so yeah, so thank you so much and just a final thank you really to you Jeanette for taking your time out today to come and deliver this session um, oh, yeah. to um, to the attendees. We really, really appreciate it um, and um, we will definitely share this, this video um, wider uh, so that it has a further reach as well. Great. Enjoy the rest of the event everyone.